The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards. Two years ago, if you told me that I was going to be making chocolate, um, I would have thought you were crazy. Farmer's holiday is called the holiday because essentially what farmers said is we are not going to have, we are not going to farm anymore. We're taking a holiday. I guess for me, fiber art is a chance to create something um, in a new way using old techniques. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Our name is terroir, chocolate. Terroir is a French word that describes the taste of place. So, the, how the region influences the flavor of the plant. I really like chocolate, but um, Two years ago, if you told me that I was going to be making chocolate, um, I would have thought you were crazy. And in fact, as I look back, I realize how little I knew as far as where it comes from. And I think I was probably one of those people, and I think there's a lot of them, that we love chocolate, we eat chocolate, and we maybe don't know anything about it, where it comes from, or anything like that. And so it's been a fun process to learn and we feel like we're just at the beginning of, of our learning process. Kristen and I got married two years ago and um, we honeymooned in Napa, California. And the first time we saw how wine was made and we saw the impact that the land could have on the flavor in our food. And right after that we toured a chocolate factory in San Francisco and Kristen tasted a bar that was made in Madagascar and it was really citrus fruity and then she tasted another one and it had no fruit tones whatsoever it was kind of a nutty almost an earthy taste and she walked out of the door and she was so excited and she essentially said that's what she wanted to do so that's how we got started and it seems like from that day in San Francisco until today, with Kristen and I, it comes up in our conversations almost like this pulling or compelling. And it started when we got back home and we started looking online and buying books and watching videos and trying to learn as much as we could. And um, the cacao plant grows in the understory of tropical climate. The pods grow on the trunk of the tree, actually. And they're about the size of a football, and they have 50 cacao beans in each pod. Um, they're surrounded by a pulpy fruit that is really tasty. The different agriculture that's grown around the cacao tree will affect the flavor of the final cacao beans and um, the elevation and the what's in the soil, the different minerals, 
Another really important flavor development that's just beginning is the fermentation process. And there are some people out there that are really skilled in the fermentation and learning about what types of flavors they're creating. So that is an industry that's just starting to create really quality cacao for small makers like Josh and I. So there's a challenge in each bar and each time we get to try the final product it's kind of just this wow moment and that keeps me inspired. So when we started to learn about this process and kind of this revolution and movement that's happening, uh, we pulled up a map and we looked at Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and we saw there was this nice territory where nobody was doing this yet. We started our company in Fergus Falls because both Josh and I are, were born here and they're also a very supportive community of the arts and of entrepreneurship. So everything just fell into place and we didn't come into any barriers. It felt like we were supposed to be here. We start with the 150 pound bag of raw cacao. We put it through a fourth generation fanning mill and that separates the size of each cocoa bean so that we can roast them in consistent sizes. From there we hand sort just to make sure that we've taken out any other impediments that happen to be in there from shipping. After hand sorting then I hand I roast in a convection oven the cacao beans and each origin takes a different amount of time. The roast is important because there's some acidic flavors being released during the roast. You have to taste it continually while roasting so that you can take it out at the flavor that you want to highlight. So then we have a gravity table that we dump 40, 50 pounds of husk and nib together on and it shakes the nibs up to one side and the husks to the other. And then we take the cocoa nibs and we put them in stone grinders and let that liquefy. And during that three day to seven day process, we taste and decide when we want to add the sugar or additional cocoa butter. After we deem it ready to take out of the conch, we then put it in a tempering machine, which is a process that it warms and cools the chocolate so the crystals can align so that you can achieve the, the sheen and the nice snap that you find in chocolate bars. and then you hand wrap the chocolate bars. Our journey's been interesting because when we seem to lay out a path of how we think it's gonna go, it doesn't go that way. And I'll make goals and I'll say, we well, hope to be um, in our new factory by this date and it just doesn't happen. Um, but then six months later or a year later you look back and you can't believe how far you got. So for us I think the key has been a community that cares and people that see what you're trying to do and they come on board and they, they really want to help with it and we've been benefactors of that and we wouldn't be here without that. I'm going to speak for Kristen here and say that She's maybe not trying to make the best chocolate in the world or, or anything like that, but she's trying to make really good chocolate, 
the best that you can out of the beans that we're able to find. And even more importantly than that, I think she's trying to point out that there's really good chocolate out there to be tasted and to give that experience to people and to be able to connect people to where it came from and what makes chocolate special. And so my encouragement would be that there's something to be tasted there and whether it's ours or some other chocolate maker, try it and keep an open mind and see what you think. There's so much uh, mystery and flavor in the different origins. I would have never known that chocolate could taste so different from Madagascar versus Belize versus Ecuador. And the larger chocolate makers, they have a set formula and it's going to taste the same each time you have it. With the bean de bar, it's more of a adventure each bar you get to try. You don't know what it's going to taste like necessarily. There's just so much to learn and I, I'll be there. the rest of my life I could do this and be content. It was in the middle of the Great Depression, 32 I think, and with the drought, times were tough. Farm prices were down to nothing, and folks were losing their farms left and right. The Farmer's Holiday was a farming movement in the 1932 and 1933 in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Iowa. And it mainly in Minnesota, it was the largest and most lasting movement was in Yellow Medicine, Candy, Ohio, Chippewa, and Lacoparo County. It was a response essentially to the Great Depression and the lack of good commodity prices. And what the was was farmers banding together and essentially trying to influence prices, trying to have a comfortable living. Farmer's holiday is called the holiday because essentially what farmers said is we are not going to have, we are not going to farm anymore, we're taking a holiday. Just to give you an example of how badly they were struggling, after the crash in 1929, farmers were, the corn, value of corn for example, was so worthless that they were actually burning it for heat because they couldn't afford heat, like fuel or even wood to buy, and so they were burning their corn for essentially to live, and in 1932, 24% of the country was in agriculture. So this was affecting a quarter of the population in the United States. So really, what it was just their anger and frustration made real, and it was action. So it was these blockades, and it was the farm sales, shouting down farm sales. They did penny auctions where they would assign people. So if the farm was being foreclosed upon, because foreclosed upon because they couldn't pay their bills, they would assign someone and they would say, all right, you're going to bid on this tractor, you're going to bid on this baler. Nobody else bid on it. And if somebody else did bid on it, it could have been dangerous for you because they would essentially, they were a very tight-knit group of farmers who only wanted to benefit themselves and they didn't want to see this other farmer basically without his farm anymore. Harold. Ruben. We're here to help you, Harold. Don't really need any help. They didn't leave us much. I think we can make it on our own. No, no, not that. You ain't leaving. We're going to stop this sale. Nah, nobody can help me. Look, we're all with you. 1932, sport was high. And Farmer's Holiday started doing blockades penny auctions, and they even started building community gardens, in Marshall in particular. And with the blockades, what they did was they would often turn back farmers. If they had perishable goods, like eggs they, or milk, in the beginning, they would let them through. But if it was chickens or cattle, they would physically take them off the farmer, and they would then send them into town and say, we'll give them back to you when you come back. So they would let them go to town, they'd come back, and they'd give it back and send them on their way. And farmers in the beginning were understanding with this. Some farmers, there, was, they were, there were altercations where a farmer was driving his um, 
cows into town and he kind of got into a scuffle with the protesters and they physically held him down, took his wagon, brought it into the ditch, tied his horses up, and then let him go and said, you know, we, we don't mean any harm, we're just trying to raise prices, this is what we're doing. And this was all good and well in the beginning, but then as the years went on, farmers started to get a little frustrated, nobody was making money, so then it turned more violent and barricades were actually run through. They would run their wagons through or they would flash guns and public opinion slowly started to change on ground on holiday. I think the holiday was important because without the farmers holiday in Midwest, the Minis in Minnesota, Wisconsin, we wouldn't see as many family farms as we do today. Yes, there are less family farms, but in the 1930s, there were so many farmers being foreclosed upon that the family farm was threatened to become almost non-existent. The only farms that could pay back their loans were those larger farms. So I, in my family, we our farm is a legacy farm. It was around during this period. It was saved during this period. And I think it's just important for people to know about because farming is such a pivotal an important part of southwestern Minnesota. If you're from a farming community, you need to know about holiday because of the importance of how it's saved. Essentially a dying community. I mean, in 1970, to give an example, 1932, 24% of the country was in agriculture in some shape or form. 1970, 4%. So, I mean, we've dropped in just 40 years down to 4% of the people who are involved in agriculture. So it's a, it's a key moment in farming history. Let's get on with the sale. Wait a minute. You've got to release that man in there first. We ain't holding him. He's free to go anytime he wants. <laughs> Sheriff, do something about this. What, Marshal? Let's get on with the sale. He's right, Marshal. By law, we've got to see this sale through. <laughs> Todd, we've got a corn planter. What am I bid on the corn planter? Anybody bid $35? Huh? $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35, $35,
Uh, when I was in high school, I continued taking sewing lessons through home economics class, and I learned to crochet. And back then, everybody used acrylic yarn, so that's what I used. About 10 years ago, I walked into a yarn shop and saw a pattern for a knit felted stocking. And I had wanted to make that because I had lost a pregnancy um, early on. I was about four months along. And I wanted some way to acknowledge that that child existed in our lives. So I bought the pattern, and the yarn shop owner said that I needed wool yarn. Well, I was aghast because wool yarn is scratchy. Who wants to use that? So she said, now go pick, pick out from those shelves over there. So I walked along and touched the, the, the yarns and was very surprised that some of them were soft. And I actually said, I don't think these are wool. And she said, yes, they are. I didn't realize that there were different breeds of sheep and some of them were soft. So I began my first project, which was a giant sock uh, made out of wool yarn. Then you throw it in the washing machine and it shrinks down. And that's kind of what got me started with what I'm doing now with fiber arts. So this is a stocking that I made for a son that I lost. His name is to be Samuel James. And the, the yarns that are on here were some of my first hand spun yarns that I got to use to embellish that. It was just a way to remember that he was part of our family. So he gets to be part of our family every Christmas and we get to think about him kind of think of them as my muse, <laughs> in a way. There are many different things in the fiber arts world. There's everything from crocheting, to knitting, to spinning, to weaving. Um, I also do dyeing of various fibers, both uh, animal protein fibers and plant fibers. Um, I have dabbled in wire knitting. Um, there are many other things I haven't tried yet, but I think I have a lot, enough to keep me busy for quite some time. When I first started, I uh, got into felting a lot because I started with the felt stocking. Um, and I designed some knitting patterns shortly after I made that one and started knitting other people's patterns. I thought, oh, I want it to be like this. So I started designing my own and I've designed over 40 patterns. But now I like to do everything from hats and scarves to sweaters and vests to, um, I, I really enjoy the Nuno felting, which is a felting technique onto a fabric base. I, I guess I like it all. I mean, some things take longer, like socks, because it's knit on very tiny needles with very small yarn. It takes a lot longer than a sweater with larger fabric, but it's just fun to play with all different kinds of yarns and different kinds of uh, fibers to make them. My studio space is in Milan, Minnesota. It's in the old Milan School Building, also called the Greater Milan Initiative Building. A group of uh, people in Milan bought the building. Um, from the city when the school was closed, when they consolidated, and they opened up the classroom spaces for artist studios, and there are several in the building now, and there are still more available. So it's a wonderful use of a building that would otherwise sit vacant and probably have to be torn down. So the process of taking the wool from the animal is when you take the wool off of a sheep, say, um, it's dirty and it's greasy, it has lanolin in it, and the animals have been out in the field, so first the, the fleece is skirted, which means you take out anything that you don't want, anything from the back end of the animal or from the belly or the neck where it has lots of grass or hay or dirt or other foreign objects that we don't want in our wool. Um, then it gets washed, which is in very hot water to dissolve the grease that's in the wool and take the dirt out. And then it's dried and then fluffed up and then carded. These are some locks of wool that have been washed, and this is one process of working with them. It's called carding, and these are actually old cards that are probably, I don't know if they're 100 years old or something, but this is the way our ancestors did it, and very often this was a, a chore that would have been left to the children because it's something they can, they can do easily. It just helps to open up the fibers.
peppers are though. Do you want them? And you can see little bits of grass and things there. You can pick them out or sometimes they'll just spin out when, fall out when you're spinning. doing that for pounds and pounds and pounds of fiber that would take some time to do. It's a chance to work with many different fibers, um, everything from cottons and, and flax for linen to uh, wools, different breeds of wool, and I love color, so you'll find lots of colorful things in the shop. Another thing that I really love is the connection with the past. I mean, men and women have been doing these things for thousands of years. You know, they have evidence of twisted fibers from 60,000 years ago. Um, but it's just so fun to sit at my wheel or sit at a loom and know that people have been doing this for hundreds of hundreds and thousands of years. And also, the connection with the animals is kind of cool too. I've been uh, privileged enough to meet some of the animals that that provide fiber that I spin with. I help at shearing at alpaca farms on occasion and have been there when they've sheared sheep and it's fun to take that right off the animal and then wash it and process it and dye it sometimes and spin it and just have that connection with the source and with the people who raised the animals and with the people who have done it for, for thousands of years. I guess for me, fiber art is a chance to create something um, in a new way using old techniques. I mean, we can spin very traditional yarn, which has been spun for thousands of years, or we can spin something fun and different using new materials that, are, that weren't available to our ancestors. Do you have an idea for the Postcards team? Email us, postcards at pioneer.org. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.